Um, so Andrew Brevard um, has been working initially in Newcastle with um, Mark Parsons and moved down two years ago now, a, a year ago, to um, work in Melbourne. He's been, um, uh, he has a suite of his own research projects as well as actually helping out um, and contributing to some of our animal projects as well as many others. Um, Andrew is actually an NHMRC Career Development Fellow and he's working on acute and recovery uh, stroke trials at now at the Melbourne Brain Centre, University of Melbourne, which is based at Melbourne Health across the road. Um, Andrew currently works with the VST, which is the Victorian Stroke Telemedicine Project, to coordinate implementation of CT perfusion imaging as a standard of care for telestroke patients. Thank you. And he's going to be speaking to us about significant brain atrophy after TIA. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you very much, Amy, and thank you for having me. It's fantastic to be the first speaker um, when everyone's high on coffee, so got some attention. Uh, so before I saw the light and moved south to Melbourne, uh, we performed a longitudinal TIA study, so longitudinal just been three months. Uh, the theory around there is just uh, was just one out of research. We were doing a sort of a cohort study, just a longitudinal follow-up on some of our patients, and we started to notice a lot of the TI patients coming in were really having a lot of trouble finding where to park, how to get into the building. So HMRI in Newcastle, it's not intuitive. Uh, finding where it is, finding the front entrance, it's sort of hidden around the back, and so they were really struggling. So we sort of noticed that there was a bit more cognitive decline, and then chatting to the clinicians, they were also quite aware of this in their cohorts as well, weren't really sure what was going on. So we wanted to undertake a bit of a bit more of a quantitative anal analysis of that, and so my pet love is brain imaging, so of course it had to have a ton of imaging in it. Uh, the theory being around there is, well, a TIA is a transient amount of ischemia in the brain, and so maybe this is uh, leading to some sort of longer term uh, injury. It's particularly relevant in stroke in the clinical world where we have no concept of the secondary neurogeneration going on. A clinician sees a patient come in the front door, does something with the thrombus, maybe uh, lyses it with thrombolysis, maybe pulls it out with clot retrieval, and then they go home and see you later. Uh, so we really want to try and investigate these more secondary effects. And a lot of this was done in the background where I'm very interested in fatigue after stroke as well. So we had a bit of a, a, a quite a, a couple of things that we were targeting. So there was a cognition and then fatigue. Um, so in, the, in these uh, TIA cohort, TIA clinically is just a nightmare. Uh, it's a very messy patient cohort because there are just so many mimics and so many unknowns. So when a clinician sees a potential TIA patient, they don't really know if it's a severe migraine, it might be a psychotic episode, it could be an, any number of things. And it could actually even be a minor stroke. So the current clinical definition of a TIA is someone who doesn't have infarct on their follow-up imaging, but they've had some kind of clinically re uh, relevant ischemic related event. So as part of this study, we made sure that all of our TIAs coming into the front door of the hospital had a CT perfusion. We made sure that there was some kind of a perfusion deficit in these patients. So that was a lot of my PhD work is around perfusion imaging. So everything has to have perfusion in it. Um, and so what we did there was we used a, a program called MyStar, which is very good at picking up you know, real perfusion lesions. Uh, and that is where there's a delay in contrast arrival to a particular area of the brain, and we call this just delay. Uh, we're not very creative in, in our acronyms. So we got a cohort of TIA patients, and then after their gold standard TIA diagnosis, so that's they have a perfusion lesion, no infarction on 24-hour follow-up imaging, we enrolled them in a uh, two-time point uh, imaging session. So we got them down to the, to the uh, research magnet, gave them a T1 uh, scan and just a couple of other structural scans, and then did a, a really minor cognitive battery. I was more interested in the imaging, so we, we did a mocker as well and just a bit of a quality of life and fatigue assessment um, in that. Um, and what, at the same time as well, we were also quite working closely with Siemens because they're very interested in our perfusion work and we we're sort of saying, oh, it's a bit of a pain in the ass to do all this uh, brain morphometry, so is there any chance that we can sort of automate this on the console on the scanner? And they had a team uh, in uh, Europe who were very keen on developing a thing that is now readily available and on consoles called Morphobox. And Morphobox is just an automated free surface, so it's a very robust and uh, it's, it's compatible with patients with a stroke who, and it does automated uh, volume segmentation. So for those who um, aren't MRI aficionados, uh, we just grab the brain, strip it away, clean it up, 
um, and then we get our volumes out of there. The, the great thing about this as well is that the scanner does it all for us. We have very little uh, interaction with it. Um, it's, it hasn't been that error prone, which is really something that's quite nice for a tool, and it's, it's readily available. So if you've got a 3T MR and uh, you know your Siemens rep, ask for MorphoBox that's out there. Um, so out of our uh, patient cohorts, once we, uh, we were able to recruit about 82 of them, we had them uh, come back for their two scans, but really there were quite a few that we had to drop out for various reasons. So some they had trouble with their MRI, some you know, we later on found they had some infarction that their later uh, follow-up scans, maybe it's because of reoccurrent stroke, because uh, the highest risk factor for stroke is having a stroke or a TIA. Uh, so you're more likely to have another one. That's why uh, secondary prevention is such a big deal. Um, but overall, we were able to get our, our 50 TIA patients. So that was quite a nice, robust cohort to have uh, 50 patients scanned at baseline and then three months. Um, and then out of our automated segmentation tool, we obviously you know, went through a lot of checking and see how everything was going. We did actually see a, a fairly significant amount of atrophy in our, our patients. So it was, wasn't constrained to any one sort of area in this 50 patient cohort. And to me, that was actually quite interesting as well, because you may expect a bit more uh, deep white matter hypo, uh, uh, atrophy or some sort of more structural changes around there. Um, but we, we didn't see uh, any statistically significant atrophy in those deep white matter structures, but we did see see sort of global volume reductions in our TIA cohort. Um, and then when we went back and reviewed the data, we wanted to try and find some interactions. And so we couldn't really see any interaction there with age or clinical severity or uh, sort of any other variables that we could be throwing at these patients in the extent of atrophy uh, at that uh, three month time point post TIA. But what we did see is in our cohort that there were an unusual number of patients with a, T, uh, a posterior circulation uh, perfusion abnormality. So in stroke, we usually see about 10% of patients coming in the front door who have a, a good big occlusion causing you know, a major stroke uh, have posterior circulation occlusions. But in our TIA cohort, that was up to 40%. So this either has something to do with the vascular structure being a little bit you know, more smaller or a bit more easy to occlude, uh, or we just better at detecting because those are a bit more symptomatic areas and patients you know, have a symptom and come in more likely than an anterior circulation stroke. And so when we divided our patient cohort by this nearly, you know, nearly midpoint uh, um, split in our, in our cohort, we did actually start to see more nuanced changes in brain anatomy there where patients with anterior circulation strokes were more likely to have this deep white matter uh, sorry, deep uh, anterior circulation TIAs were more likely to have sort of deep white matter atrophy. Particularly, we did end up reaching statistical significance when it comes to a volume reduction around the thalamus, which that was where we did see this uh, 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 statistically significant uh, reduction in our deep uh, uh, th thalamic structure. So that was ipsilesional. So that was on the same hemisphere as the uh, the, the, um, the ischemic event was. So we're not calling it a stroke because it was a TIA. Um, and then in our um, Posterior circulation the patients, less structures became statistically significant in their atrophy. The while there were some uh, fairly substantial volume changes, the, the variability in that was quite profound. Uh, so we didn't reach significance there. But what we then realized is that it's very localized. So the, the circulation matters, the, the, the patient matters, and you know, you're looking at a very uh, nuanced approach to trying to find these, uh, these changes in these patients because all of a sudden we're having a high highly selected patient cohort in who we call a TIA. These are severe TIAs because they have that perfusion lesion, they don't have flow-up infarction, so we, we can't you know, say that all, all of this atrophy is just due to uh, sort of an infarction or, or something because we didn't see it on a DWI. While DWI may not be the goal, you know, the best measure, it's what we use as standard, and so that should just always be our reference point. Um, so then in these patients, we did actually see um, in the global cohort of all 50, we didn't see any changes in our mocker scores between time points, but when we broke it up by where uh, the, um, the TIA was, we did actually see statistically significant changes in those mocker scores correlating with patients with the anterior circulation TIA having worse outcomes. And then that was related to having uh, their extent of atrophy as well. So we had this, these, these nice things line up in only a 50 patient cohort, which is pretty good. Um, so that really just goes to show that there's a lot happening there and sort of in, in talking to clinicians, they're sort of aware but not really too sure what to do with all of this. It's, it's you, you know, you present this data and you sort of say, great, uh, what now? You know, what drug can I give them? Like, well, you know, 
Can we just do more studies first? Um, and it becomes a bit of a challenge now. It's because we, we have the tools, we have the diagnostic uh, power to sort of break up our patients in their acute um, workup and then their follow-up, and then we have these very powerful MRI tools which are getting easier to use for people, especially with the uh, coming into the use of AI where it's an automated imaging analysis, particularly around QSM, which is a, a very exciting thing coming out. Um, but overall goes to show that we were able to confirm the hypothesis that it's the ischemia that's potentially leading all of this uh, cognitive uh, changes and uh, um, rather than just blunt dead tissue leading to a sort of a mass disability and that we need to be a bit more nuanced in stroke recovery world about how we characterize what's going on there. Um, and so the spin-offs from this is where I'm pretty interested and where we're at at the moment is one I actually want to go back to the lab and sort of say that we, we're looking at a pure ischemic model without infarction. What is this, if we can replicate that in an animal, what does that do to an animal? Do they see similar disabilities if they don't have that macro infarction where you wipe out a half of the brain and sort of hope for the best? Um, and then, you know, if we can recreate this in an animal model, we just want to bombard them with drugs and see which ones make them better. Um, the challenge here is in animal models, everything seems to make them better. So we want to try and be a bit more discerning in, in something that can be clinically applicable because uh, there's a lot of uh, current medications around for clinical use that you can just repurpose. And that's what we're doing in our fatigue trials and it's working very well. Um, but then as an extension of, of this TIA work, I'm very interested, interested now in the use of thrombectomy after stroke. So around 2015, uh, five major trials came out saying if you just yank the clot out uh, mechanically, the patients do dramatically better. And that is now standard of care for patients with a large vessel occlusion and is why there's such a big ramp up of telehealth services globally to bring patients from rural centres into here. Uh, into the hubs that can you know, do this mechanical thrombectomy. But what you also see is that thrombectomy is resulting in reperfusion of ischemic tissue faster and more robustly than thrombolysis ever has. So you're salvaging more brain uh, in these patients and so they end up having smaller infarcts and better outcomes. So does that also alter their, cl their clinical outcome uh, and their cognitive outcome you know, months down the track? And so we're working uh, with uh, Noah Fiasi at uh, Royal Melbourne as well. Uh, I think that was a bit quick, but uh, thank you. Seriously, so many questions. I mean, that's just it's such exciting research to think that these are DWI negative, but perfusion positive um, uh, um, people, so they don't have an established infarct. And I think it really is speaking to the fact that there is this transsynaptic, transneuronal atrophy that's occurring after this ischemic injury, which may, may be mediated by um, probably by neuroinflammation, my theory. Um, so I'm sure you've got lots of questions for Andrew, but we'll have to wait until the end. Um, so write them down. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce